Everyone, welcome to Recess, brought to you by Road Monk. We're so glad you could take a break with us today. Um, we've postponed all of our in-person product-to-product events that were hosted in Toronto, New York, and Chicago um, due to COVID. For, so the for the time being, um, Recess is where you can learn about all things product with awesome PMs. My name is Amy, and I'm a content marketing specialist at Road Monk, and I'll be hosting our Recess session today. If you do follow our community, we also have a podcast called Product to Product that I host and produce and you could subscribe to um to it on your preferred podcasting platform um we're recording this live session but we'll also be posting the recording plus a summary with time codes on our medium page in the coming days so if you missed a point no worries we got you we'll give you the time code and you can go back to it easy peasy um we'll just wait a couple more seconds for people to filter in. Again, feel free to let us know where you're from, what company you're at, and what role you're in. Also, let us know if you're a repeat attendee because we love seeing that. Um, today, we have Liz, Road Monk's Events Manager, moderating. She'll be taking your questions, so feel free to send them in throughout this chat, and we'll answer them in the last 10 minutes of this 30-minute session. Okay, let's get started. Today we have Julia from NYX with us. Welcome to Recess, Julia. Hi, thanks for having me. So Julia is an e-commerce PM at NYX, which is a women's intimates company based in Toronto. Um, Julia, when we talked about your journey into product in our pre-interview, you had a funny term. You said you tripped into product and then you actually started out as a customer experience member. Um, can you tell me the steps you took to take you from CX into product? Totally. Um, yeah, so I started in customer service and was, it was a pretty small team at the time. Uh, we were about eight people. So I would get customer feedback and then, you know, want to make changes on the site based on that feedback. So I would work with our contract developer at the time. Uh, and I had an awesome boss who was like, oh, you're doing user experience design. And I was like, mm, I don't think so. I'm using Microsoft Paint. Um, <laughs> so again, tripped and fell into this role. Yeah. Um, so in doing, you know, a few more of those projects and growing with the company, I was able to get promoted into a merchandising role where I was doing um, more like web-based work uh, and again, continuing to work on those like user experience changes. Mm -hmm. um, but when I was a merchandiser, we had about 10 products, so there wasn't a ton of merchandising to do. Um, right. So I started project managing the changes that were happening on the site, which kind of accidentally turned into product management. So now I'm the e-commerce product manager at Nix. Awesome. Um, so how do you think your time as a CX member helped you in your role as a PM now? I think it's so important and such a wonderful, like happy accident. I'm really glad it happened that way because I think as a product manager, you really want to be the voice of the customer. You're this kind of middle ground between the business problems and the user problems and being able to advocate for those customers and having really heard their pain points in depth. Um, it's been a great way to lead into this role. Right. And you mentioned a little bit previously that um, to transition into CX to, P, uh, to PM hood, it, it took encouragement from your managers. Totally. Um, what were the, and, but you also mentioned in your pre-interview, you're like me, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. That's not me. But how, what were the things that you, did or had to learn or like level up um, to, for this transition to happen? Totally. Yeah. As I said, like I didn't really know what I was doing was what I was doing. So it took some encouragement from some really awesome managers that I've had along the way. Um, so I think a big like leveling up is just kind of like owning what you're good at, even if you didn't necessarily know it was what you were doing. Um, I think just like taking a gift, like taking kind of, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, basically. Like if you happen to be doing something awesome, run with it. Um, but I think a big thing that I had to kind of like level up was like scrum, anything dev related. Like I had never worked with a developer before. Like right. I didn't know how websites work. So there was a huge learning curve there. But again, I think leaning on your coworkers and being really open of what, what you don't know, mm -hmm. um, people are often really happy to help uh, and want to see you be you know a great PM. Yeah, um, we also discussed in our pre-interview that a lot of times in product, when PMs have this mindset like, oh, just think like the customer, they kind of overdo it and they forget that they're actually not the customer. Um, can you talk about how this um, can actually hinder a product team? Totally. I think that as much as I'm so happy that I started in customer service, there is kind of like a flip side of that coin where for 
probably too long. I was like, I know the customer. I was just <laughs> chatting with her. And then uh, my like work wife at Nix was just like, you haven't worked in customer service for like over a year. Like you actually don't know, like the sites changed, the products have changed. Like this is kind of what they're actually talking about. So I think sometimes, especially when you're similar to your customer, yes. um, like, I'm like a young millennial woman who buys bras and underwear. I get a period, all that good stuff. So I'm like our target market. So I sometimes think I am the customer, but I'm not going through the site the way a customer is coming cold off of Instagram. I am way, I know way too much. Um, so I think reminding yourself of that and actually tapping into your customer service team and saying, what are the issues of today? You know, um, we release to our site, we release code to our site, you know, every other week. So our site is changing constantly, even if it's small things. So I think owning that you're not the customer, owning that you're not, you know, an active member of your CX team um, and letting them speak for the customer or even better, um, doing customer interviews and letting the customer just, you know, speak directly to you. It's, it's an awesome way to make sure that you're interpreting them correctly in your mind. Right. Um, can you talk a, a little bit about the campaigns that Nix has launched using real life people as models? And what are some of the feedback uh, that customers have been giving you from that? Yeah, um, we really put the customers at the heart of everything we do. Um, and we've been really lucky in having um, a dedicated user base who like wants to be a part of these campaigns. Like it's not every day your customers are gonna be like, yeah, I'll strip down in my underwear. <laughs> like, I don't care. Our latest campaign was like all women over 50. Um, cool. And it was like, really, really um, badass to, to see these women own your brand um, and what it embodies and kind of like just similarly like take it and run with it um mm -hmm. so we've we've had amazing feedback i think women are stoked to see themselves um especially in the intimate apparel um like not everyone looks like a victoria's secrets model and not everyone wants to um and i think so customers are really eager for kind of where we're meeting them mm -hmm. um i know you work with a very small team and you're the e-commerce pm tell me um sort of the structure of that team and what are some of the challenges you've had to overcome for sure. So um, I'm the single PM on the team and we have a director above us and then we have three developers, one kind of lead, um, one intermediate and one junior. We have a QA and then we have two merchandisers. Um, and I would say more than half those roles have uh, joined in the last year. Mm -hmm. So it's been a huge um, kind of learning curve of like how we work with so many people. Um, I think alongside that we like integrated agile and like sprint planning. Um, so there's just been a huge learning curve. I think um, the nice thing is that we're all really excited about what we're doing um, right. and all want to do a great job. So, but there's definitely been, I think a couple moments in like sprint retro where we're like looking around and being like, well, that was a weird one. Like <laughs> what happened? And I think just like our eagerness to improve kind of bridges the gap for what we lack in kind of experience. Yeah. So kind of piggybacking on that point when you say like, oh, what happened? We thought we got this right. Can you give an example of one time when you were like, you know what? I think we did the user research. We think this experiment's going to work. We think this product is going to land well. And it didn't. Yeah, we um, we had this feature that encouraged like cross shopping and we put it up and had to basically take it back really quickly, which is the first time that that's happened. I think partially because we're just doing a, it's kind of a catch point too, because it's like proof that we're doing a better job of like tracking our projects. <laughs> um, so we're like, oh, like good to know that this isn't working and we should take it back. Uh, it ended up impacting site speed really negatively and like slowed the whole thing down, um, which in turn, triggered like a really interesting site speed project of like some code rewriting that we did. Yeah. Um, so like silver lining, but um, yeah, uh, that was, that was a recent project where we're like, Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's think about this. Let's dig a little deeper. Um, but again, yeah, I think like it was a great learning. Like now we know site speed's like a thing that we have. It's not just about the user, like the raw user experience of like, looking at design files and being like, how's a customer clicking around? It's like, if the customer, if the page never loads for the customer, they're not clicking anywhere. So yes. really zooming out and thinking about the holistic 
customer experience. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned that a lot of customers are very into the brand Nix. And, but how, how do you, what are some of the ways that you guys get feedback? Do you just look at the Instagram comments? Do you um, let them click through the website? What are some ways that your team does it? Yeah, I mean, customer service feedback is kind of our number one. Um, I, I recently delved into like one-on-one -on -one, uh, user research, which was really exciting. Um, before all this pandemic, we had beautiful new stores. Um, at, and we have one here in Toronto, which is um, such a gift because I get to go in and talk to customers and see how they shop in real life versus right. how they shop online. And I mean, I can't wait for this to be over for a number of reasons, but um, my user experience research is, is on the list. Awesome. Um, we talked a little bit about your managers being very um, encouraging. Mm -hmm. And when I speak to a lot of uh, women in tech, especially one of one female tech leader, she's like, you know, confidence is like a muscle. You just kind of need to stretch it. Were there times when you were in a PM role, you're like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't think I'm good at this. I feel like an imposter. That's, and how did you get over it? I mean, that's like every other day. Um, <laughs> uh, I think two things that have really helped is, yeah, having really key players along the way to boost you up when you're really like looking around being like, I'm alone in this. Like I'm really feeling overwhelmed and scared and, you know, incapable. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a couple of really good managers do that and like be the person to pull me out. I also have an incredible lead dev who, I mean, I came into this with no technical knowledge right. and he will sit with me and walk me through some like seriously basic concepts um, time and time again. So that has been super helpful. But the thing that I've been able to do for myself um, is I started a medium. Okay. Writing like the articles that I wanted to read when I was really struggling with something and it's that idea of like once taught is like twice learned. And I think creating the content that I want for myself, like I go back and reread my own stuff. <laughs> like it's truly there like 99% for myself just to like mm -hmm. affirm what I've learned, but also act as like a piece of reference material. Because yeah. sometimes when you're growing so quickly, you have to like learn the same lesson a few times. Right. Yeah. Um, let's jump into questions because we have a few and this is kind of what you just spoke about. Um, what did you learn? What did you do outside of work, if anything, to scale your dev related skills or learnings? Yeah. Um, again, right, writing a medium or doing stuff like that and going to events like not every event is going to be good. I swear this is I was not asked to plug this, but Road Monk events are actually really, really <laughs> Um, I, I like scoured your website when I first started as a PM because I also use their software. Again, not asked to say this. No, nope, not at all. Genuinely like their software um, and really enjoy their content. Um, so find the events that work for you, but know that you're going to go to some really boring events and like just take the free beer and chalk it up to a bad event. Yeah. Um, what are some uh, work from home tips that you have or you and your team are working through? Because we're now in a situation where we're all forced to work from home and not everybody was like a remote first or even had this work from home culture. So what are some tips that you and your team are using? Good question. I mean, I think a lot of developers actually really like working from home, at least my team does. So that's been really nice. But um, I would say... <laughs> this is kind of basic advice, but like be really easy on yourself. I was like really trying to like force myself to be like this, like hyper productive person the first few weeks. And I just like every day would feel not only unaccomplished, but defeated. Yeah. And so I think the more I kind of let myself realize that like whatever we get done today is what we get done. And like we're showing up um, was a bit of a mind switch. And one of those funny things that as soon as I let myself be unproductive, I was like having super productive days. So right. just be easy on yourself. I think that's, that's a tip I, I did for myself too. I was like, there's no way I can be a hundred percent output at this point. You know, I'm just going to do the surface things I can get done, at least turn it. And then when your mind is in this creative burst, you just get going. Mm -hmm. um, look at your background. You have a few plants. I know you worked at a nursery before. Um, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Before your tech life, um, and now we're at home, and I've been just browsing Instagram, and there's like buy a plant off us, and we'll deliver it to you. But are there some plants that are just very easy to take care of for newbies? Yes. Um, <laughs> this is a snake plant. You oh like, my god, lush. Can't, 
kill it. It's yeah. so, I forget to water this guy all the time. Uh, snake plants are really easy. Um, that's probably like my go-to reco. Snake plant, yeah. Um, here's a second question that we got. Um, your work mentor sounds incredible. Was having that support a key factor in making the decision to join Nix? Or what other factors played in a uh, played a role in taking the position, even though you didn't have any experience? Ooh, okay. I might have to ask the second part. But to answer the first part, yeah. um, I actually had that really key mentor for less than a year. Um, she was a manager. She was the customer service manager um, at a really like pivotal point. Um, and interestingly enough, like the other person who was a mentor for me also worked for Nix for probably only a year. So. I think it's it's not necessarily having these like long beautiful relationships that you like see in movies or whatever or, like right. read on blogs like it really is like striking while the iron is hot if you click with somebody who's ahead of you like nine tenths out of the ten people are super eager to help right. so you know ask ask for it um and also in my case like I really had to talk to my own self and take their advice and um, kind of get out of my own way. So if someone's offering to help, don't be this person who's like, oh, me? Like, don't play coy. Take that help. <laughs> grow your career. Do it. Yeah. Okay. And what was the second part of the question? It's, uh, it, what other factors played a role in taking the, pretty much taking the PM position, jumping from CX to PM? Um, it's going to sound a little nerdy, but like, I love to solve problems and I love whether it's a user problem or a business problem. So I just kind of kept going where like the interesting problems were like for me, it was like first helping the customer. It's like, okay, how do I get in there? How do I help a customer get in their size? Then I was like, okay, how do I help a customer get into their size? Like every time they come to the site, like regardless whether they're American or Canadian or like large chested or small chested. And then just, yeah, for me, it was like hunting the bigger, more interesting problems. Right. Um, here's another question. Um, can you talk about your one-on-one -on -one customer feedback get gathering um, framework and how has this helped you pivot or reiterate on your product? Um, I would say I don't have a framework. I am, am making it up as I go. <laughs> um, we are pretty new to this style of user testing. So right. the one thing that I knew I wanted to do is I knew I wanted to ask the same questions in the same order. So my number one piece of advice on user testing is pick the first three people and don't include them in your study because you're going to learn how you actually want to run your test on those first two or three people. Um, yeah. So if you want like a sample size of 15, get 17, 18 people to join because you're going to learn more about how you're running the test with the first people than you actually will learn about what you're trying to learn about. So that's okay. kind of my number one tip. Um, so I know a lot of uh, feedback is either they're very happy with the product or they're very upset with the product. And then you have this middle ground of people who are just like, yeah, well, you know, I bought it and I, I kind of don't like it or I'm okay with it, but I don't care to reach out to them to let them know. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of suss out this uh, lackadaisical fan base? Oh, interesting question. Um, I would say looking at repeat purchase rate. Mm -hmm your um you know your standout customers they're gonna buy from you again and again and talk about you on social um and the people who are unhappy are gonna also let you know probably on social um and then those middle people are probably not going to purchase from you again so i think um, monitoring your repeat purchase rate is a really good way to see like how many people are like fine with what we do right yeah um so if you know, money and titles and nothing didn't matter and we lived in a non-judgmental world, what would you actually be doing? Oh, good question. Ooh. It could be totally zany because I think for me, mine would be an elementary uh, lunch lady in Japan for children because just the way they like respect food and the way they help each other like get lunches, you would just be so happy cooking for everybody for lunch. Oh my gosh, that is like fantastic. <laughs> Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I really do love like solving problems. And I think, I mean, it's a bit of like a career question for myself is like, what is that ultimate problem that I want to solve? Like, what's that really interesting piece? Like, I think a piece of me would love to like help work for the government because the government is so inefficient. <laughs> um, no offense, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, like working for the government has its own challenges. So I don't really know, but really good question. Yeah. Um, here's another one. 
Um, I don't know if you've ever felt burnt out at your job, though, because I feel like your team is lean and it's still new and growing. Um, what do you do when you feel burnt out at a, at a startup or tech role? Um, I think I was kind of feeling this uh, a few weeks ago with quarantine. Yeah. Um, and I just, I mean, I was really honest, like, again, that lead dev, she's like my rock. Uh, and I also have like a wonderful, like work well, wife, like we've worked together for almost three years now and we're really good friends. Right. Um, so just like having a good cry with somebody who knows all the players in the situation. Um, I think sometimes you can't always talk to your friends or like a, a partner about this stuff. Like having somebody who, who knows it um, is great. And I think that's one of the reasons why I love working at Nick so much is the people that I work with are amazing and we're actually, a lot of us are friends. Um, so you can have those kind of vulnerable moments. I know that's not um, always like a safe space for everyone at their work, but um, just vent and, and be honest about when you're having too much on your plate. Um, trust that you work really hard and that asking for help isn't saying that you're working hard like not hard enough it's just saying that you're at capacity um and yeah like that being being easy on yourself <laughs> right totally i understand and especially in this in this time when it's very different for everyone how everyone reacts is very different and you know quarantining by yourself is very different than quarantining with two three kids quarantining with your elderly parents you know all different so just you're right, be kind to yourself. Um, is there one person or a brand that you take inspiration from in this industry in terms of like tech and product world? Ooh, I mean, lots of, um, lots of Shopify stores, lots of e-commerce. Um, Allbirds has a great website. Um, Girlfriend Collective has a great website. Gymshark. Uh, sometimes the brands are brands I wouldn't necessarily buy for. There's this brand called Chubby's. It's like a men's <laughs> like shorts company oh. um, but they they were pretty like yeah, leaders uh in the day i haven't gone to their site recently but i remember getting a lot of random uh instagram ads for them right for a while. um and then also like going like way outside your sector like don't be afraid to you know look at something else like um look at a museum website museum websites are terrible but like why um, sometimes it's helpful to have something on the other end, end of the spectrum of like what you want to avoid. <laughs> right. Um, and you mentioned earlier in this talk that you are getting more into analytics, your team is digging more into that. Um, are there any tools or what's your dashboard look like when you're gathering all this data? Um, I mostly use GA, like Google Analytics and Shopify. Um, our GAs, our data is pretty, um, like limited to those two. Um, so if you have a Shopify store and enable enhanced e-commerce as quickly as you can, so you start getting that data, even if you're not using it yet, it's a little setting, message me on LinkedIn, I'll show you where you can get it, but enable it and then you can use the data later when that's the time. Right, um, one last fun question. Um, if there was such thing as startup or tech or product prom, uh, what would be the song that you walk out to? Oh my God. Great. Um, <laughs> my first go-to answer was Skater Boy by Avril Lavigne because that's my go-to karaoke song. Okay. Okay. Memories back. <laughs> that would be your... your what would memory. be yours? Um, I think mine would be TLC No Scrubs only because again, it's my go-to karaoke song. <laughs> Oh, good. And I think people could join in. Um, Julia, as we wind down the recess session, is there anything else you'd like to add um, to maybe people in CX looking to pivot into product? Yeah, I would say um, see if you can do like a shadow project or even if you request something of your PM in customer service, wireframe something like just see what it is to go through the process of thinking through the end conclusion. Like, don't just give your PM a problem. Say like, I also do user research and looked at these three sites and this is how they're solving this problem. Do we think that those are interesting? So just take it half a step further and, and see what you learn. Right. Are, the, are those those things that you did when you were in CX? Like those are, I feel like when we spoke in the pre-interview, you said you sort of went above and beyond what um, your PM was asking for you and they really saw your potential to than do the tasks of a PM. Yeah, I mean, we didn't have a PM when I was in customer <laughs> service. Um, we didn't even have like full-time developers. So 
Um, I kind of did it because I didn't know that that was something you shouldn't do as a customer service rep, to be honest. Uh, Overachiever, look at you. <laughs> yeah, guys, I'm a big nerd. So uh, <laughs> just uh, love to solve uh, problems for a customer. But um, yeah, just I would say wherever you kind of think a project is done, spend like one more hour on it and just see what you learn in sitting with it a little bit longer. Um, I find that that's sometimes where I, I get some good breakthrough moments. Right. Okay, everyone, um, as we wind down our session, I want to thank Julia for being really generous with her time and being a guest on Recess and you, the viewer, for attending. So, Julia, you mentioned Medium. Where else can people find you and what, is, what can they search to find you or connect? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Medium or you can find me on LinkedIn. Feel free to DM me with questions or if you want to nerd about product management, I'd love to do that. <laughs> Okay, great. So um, we'll be posting this recording and a summary uh, with time codes on Medium. So look forward to that. And our next recess session is May 12th, and we look forward to having you join us. And if you're interested to learn how to make um, the most of Roman Monk while working remotely, our amazing CX team member, Aaron Peck, will be hosting a webinar tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern time. So you can go to go.roadmonk.com slash webinars to sign up. Thanks, everyone, for dropping by. Have a great week. Thank you, Julia. Bye. Bye.